Yes, thank you. And thank you to Carolyn for such a warm introduction and for the opportunity, I suppose, to showcase environmental history in this event um, and to, to meet all of you who I probably wouldn't have otherwise have come across um, at this point in my uh, time here at ANU. So, well, no, how do we, there we go. Alrighty. Helpmate or pest? These have been the enduring uh, depictions of camels in Australia since their arrival in the mid 19th century. Over the past few decades, historians of settler colonialism in Australia have rightly examined the vital role of South Asian camel drivers in the exploration of the continent's dry interior and in the development of transportation networks and communications across the desert. Historians of Aboriginal communities in the inland have revealed the extent of the interactions between Aboriginal peoples, camels and camel handlers, which for a long time had been kept um, quite separate. And for environmental historians, the camel has been among the examples of Anglo acclimatization folly gone quite awry, with the continent's inland now home to the world's only significant population of wild camelus dromedaries, deemed feral and an invasive species, which is subject to culling. So you might not have been aware during the uh, bushfires of, of the summer that plans to cull camels in central Australia came to the attention of media outlets around the world. And we just have a few of those headlines up on the slides. And camel culls, I think, in the international imagination really intersected with the droughts and bushfire stories. There was great outcry in Turkey. A member of the ruling Justice and Development Party criticised the cull as a not humane approach. And in Somalia, the Somaliland Camel Herders Association were reportedly deeply saddened, calling for the camels to be sent to us so we can take care of them. Now accompanied by their handlers, camels provided the means for the projection of settler colonialism into the Australian desert well into the 20th century. The sparseness of Anglo populations, the hostility of indigenous peoples and the scarcity of water ensured that the settler project in these climes was always a precarious one. What the camel offered that competing draft animals, the horse and the mule, could not, was their stamina over long, long, long distances where fresh water was scarce across the arid interior. Now, by 1895, there was about 4,000 camels in Western Australia, about 1,500 in South Australia, and 500 in New South Wales. The most recent estimate of their population is as high as a million, but a more likely number is about 600,000 throughout uh, the inland. And this is, as I mentioned earlier, the largest population of free ranging one humped camels in the world. And this is where they congregate, as you can see on the map. Now the photographs on this slide highlight the damage that camels can do. They break fencing, they drain water holes, they denude vegetation, they damage infrastructure, all undesirable behaviour, um, very unruly creatures, um, as we see here. And certainly um, Indigenous communities at the beginning of the year were reporting on the need to control these populations because they were even getting into air conditioning units um, to access water, such as being the, the long drought um, in what is already quite a tri part of um, the continent. But when it comes to animals in Australia, local or imported, imported native or alien, domesticated or feral, settler Australians seem to have pursued a kind of Goldilocks approach. There's either too many, not enough, just right, or not any left. And when it comes to the unwanted and undesirable, the too many, they become invaders to be fought or on frontiers in battles to subdue the threat to settler pastoralism and agriculture. You might have heard of the ill-fated emu war in Western Australia. These escapees, fugitives, infestations, swarms and colonies of foreigners become embroiled in and mapped onto debates about the other in settler Australia. These terms, of course, raise questions of belonging, of what is normal and natural, what is worthy and what is not, questions of size and scale. But who answers these questions? More often than not, it's been Western science, the state-sponsored form, the sciences of development, as Libby Roman calls them, which have long spoken for nature in Australia. And more often than not, Aboriginal knowledge of these creatures has gone unacknowledged, raising questions, of course, of whose expertise matters and how is that expertise acquired and to what end? 
These themes all course through the camel's history in inland Australia, where within about four decades, the dromedaries had gone from asset to unwanted. And more often than not, they continue to be a problem to be managed. That is, if they can't be used somehow for profit, then they must be curbed, culled. In his work on the Argentine ant, Australian writer and critic Adam Gall notes that the notion of animal excess as a problem in any environment is dependent upon assumptions about whether the means used to deal with such problems is itself excessive. Now, he was looking at the use of organochlorine pesticides. In the case of the camel, though, their control is most often through aerial and ground shooting. And I've been careful not to show you any photos of that because I don't think we need to see it to believe it. Now, it hasn't always been that way. Indeed, camels were imagined in Australia before uh, they put their hooves down in the desert. As early as 1831, a retired officer of the East India Company had claimed that importing camels would be necessary for the exploration and settlement of the Australian desert interior. But it wasn't until the 1860s, though, that camels really proved their value um, to the colonial project, which was during McKinley's relief expedition for that ill-fated uh, uh, debacle of Burke and Wills. His enthusiasm for camels encouraged Thomas Elder to import camels from North India to South Australia, where they established a breeding depot at Beltana. And with these camels came their South Asian handlers, colloquially known as Afghans or Ghans, who came from, of course, a much wider region, including Rajasthan, Kashmir, Baluchistan, and Sindh. From the 1860s, these camels and their handlers were recruited to join exploring parties through the Australian interior, and they serviced the construction of the overland telegraph line throughout uh, the middle of the continent. We learned about camel time, for instance, because that was the way you could measure distance. And thanks to the pioneering narratives of desert exploration, uh, these camels earned a reputation for their endurance, for their special qualities. But although they were heralded for their role in exploration and on the gold fields, it didn't take long for settler resentment towards uh, camels and their handlers to grow. Hostile commentators framed both Asian bodies and Asian practices as contaminants on the gold fields, for instance, of Western Australia. One observer reported of conditions in 1893 that the camels and Afghans are the filthiest lot that ever went near water. Around some of the wells, the ground is little short of a manure heap, reeking with filth. You can find the Afghans washing their dirty linen on the edge of the well, and the splashes of suds falling out of their buckets go into the water. With calls to, quote, severely punish those Asiatics who so wantonly and systematically pollute the wells, the tensions over water on the gold fields often boiled over quite violently. Now this rhetoric of health and disease also extended to the bodies of the camels themselves. There hadn't been any official quarantine restrictions in Western Australia until 1895, when the mayor of Coolgardie petitioned the government, uh, pointing out that Western Australian camels were contracting diseases from the new ones that had arrived. And this pushed the colonial government into action. They instituted a 30 day quarantine period and decreed that no camels could be landed apart from at certain ports and they needed special permission. Those precautions, of course, weren't adequate for the South Australians and they imposed their own longer 90 day period of quarantine. So it's putting up all these legislative uh, barriers to um, the, the unwanted uh, camel, the unruly camel body. By 1908 though, Anglo-Australians were proudly declaring that the camel had been improved in Australian conditions. The governments of South Australia and Western Australia had established their own breeding depots and many individual camel owners, uh, whether they were South Asian or Anglo-Australian, were carrying out breeding their own camels. In WA, the Chief Inspector of Rabbits reported that I think the local camel is more enduring and can do without water for a longer period than the imported one. Of course, the imported one coming from British India. The Chief Inspector of Stock concurred that the Australian camel is endowed with greater powers of endurance. And they all agreed um, with each other, these commentators, that Anglo-Australians were best suited to handling camels rather than South Asians. Of course, echoing the exclusionary sentiments that have only been legislated with Federation in 1901, certainly nationally. 
that we can know though as much as we do about the colonial camel industry is actually partly a result of this regime of, of control. The documented encounters of the state with animal subjects, for instance, illuminate efforts to regulate animal bodies in terms of their health, their ownership and mobility, uh, such as quarantine laws, registration and census, importation, curfews, even down to the branding on the camel bodies. You could, uh, I suppose, patent your brand. You have to register that with the government. Records of the enforcement of these regulations reveal the nature and extent of animal transgressions and the human responses that were arising as a result, whether they were documented by the state or by observers in newspapers, very vocal observers. The accounts of animal handlers can also offer more intimate insights with particular creatures and particular conditions, while also describing the animal's characteristics and uses, although these do tend to be um, more um, Anglo-Australian, at least around the turn of the 20th century. That changes subsequently. Of course, exploration materials such as maps and journal entries also allow for spatial and temporal insights into animal behaviour in particular environments. So I just thought it was fascinating that we had here just a handful of photographs indicating this Asiatic camel, which had become Australian um, somehow through being there, um, actively being, uh, I suppose, recruited into state building um, in the early 20th century. Now, as for Aboriginal people, uh, initially encountering a camel um, was quite frightening, um, and this was understandable, of course, but soon, um, not surprisingly, Aboriginal people developed close relationships with camels, not least by working in the camel industry itself as handlers, but also through their work in um, exploration um, and expeditions where they were often guides, um, uh, sometimes willingly, sometimes not. Also camel, uh, Aboriginal trackers use camels as well. Now, the camel in Australia was of course a means to an end. The exploration and settlement of the harsh Australian inland and the extraction and commodification of its natural resources. The South Australian camel handler uh, by the name of Philipson observed in 1895 that camels are the only motive power that is of any service in times of drought to which the interior of this country is so subject. So camels retained their value in the Australian deserts only until cheaper or faster alternatives such as motor cars and trains became available. And they were, I suppose, part of that process of building those networks though, uh, hauling uh, the equipment and the, providing the provisions for the workers on those transportation networks. Now, despite their significance to opening up the continent to colonial capitalism, the camel's temperament does not seem to have endeared them to many. Again, we have Philipson giving us an insight into some of the settler sentiment towards them. Though camels from the early, earliest history of the world have been the most valuable servants and saved the lives of all classes and conditions of people by their good services. And though there is no animal more domesticated, still no one can feel affection for a camel like he can for a horse or a dog. He himself is devoid of sympathy and is extremely ugly and declines at all times to show any regard or affection or accept any familiarity from his rider. So the camels were clearly of independent mind. But supplanted by other forms of transport, the camel became unwanted or too expensive to maintain according to the wave of legislation at the turn of the 20th century that compelled their handlers to keep their camels on private land, to keep a close eye on them and to contain them. In many cases, they had to let their camels go. Camels and their handlers had come under close surveillance, but now though, the camels were no longer property nor under supervision. They were difficult to keep track of and they defied property boundaries, trespassing on private land. South Australia's response to this new problem in 1925 was to pass the Camel Destruction Act, the first one of its kind, which gave power to landholders to destroy camels found to be trespassing on their property. And by the 1930s, we have photographs like these of a wild bull at Momba Station in northwestern New South Wales near Real Kenya, which had been part of a, a network of camel tracks, the third largest inland port in its day. And in the mid 1940s, you can just make out uh, amongst the, I suppose, landscape, if you like, a feral camel in the Northern Territory captured on film by the anthropologist Charles Mountford. So these images um, with their captions of wild and feral 
I'm trying to work out whether that's as much about the camels themselves as about the, the frontier um, of which they're inhabiting. They're under, undomesticated, untamed, and yet they're not really causing a problem just yet. Um, so they're not necessarily a problem for the state. For Western Desert and Southern Aranda people, camels by this time, by the sort of post-1945 period, are becoming valuable means of transportation and mobility across country. Although camels don't seem to have been incorporated into customary practices, anthropologists have found that camels have been attributed other symbolic meanings, particularly for communities that came into sustained contact with missionaries. Having been taught Christmas nativity stories that associate camels with the three wise men, Many among the Pichin Jajara of the Western Desert identify the camel with Jesus Christ. So there was another way of making meaning of um, these creatures beyond their clear use um, of getting around. By the 1960s, the number of camels, there was the first kind of effort to estimate um, their number, it's around 15 to 20,000. And the population was actually expected to decline. There wasn't much hope for them. They were what a geographer in the mid 1970s described as friendly vermin, whose no small numbers weren't really posing a problem. Now around this time, the Australian inland became subject to a new scientific field of inquiry, that of rangeland science, which supported pastoral enterprises in semi-arid lands. And it was also at this point in time that the US imposed tougher restrictions on their beef imports regarding bovine tuberculosis and, and some other diseases, which camels can harbor. So, starting to set the scene perhaps for a bit of a problem emerging. In the late 1980s, the population of feral camels was estimated to be around 43,000, potentially more than double the estimate just um, a couple of decades ago. So not declining after all. And by this time, they're roaming over a more complex landholding system of Aboriginal freehold and leasehold, pastoral leases, conservation reserves and vacant crown land across four states and territories. Quite an interjurisdictional challenge. Although the camel populations might not have troubled local Aboriginal communities in the 1990s when um, some of the first surveys of um, Aboriginal communities were being made, attitudes did come to change about 20 years later, at least to the, to the extent that some kind of management might be necessary. The anthropologist Petronella Vazon Morell interviewed and surveyed communities across the Northern Territory, Western Australia, and South Australia about their attitudes towards camels and the strategies used for their control. The issue wasn't so much with the camels as an imported creature, not buying into the um, native uh, versus imported binary, but rather with the problems that their growing population was posing to waterholes as well as to culturally significant resources and even road safety. They were worried um, about hitting them in their, in their cars or attacking their children. And for all the potential benefits of employment and income that many communities acknowledged, only one community supported their culling, that of Wallakara in South Australia. And Vaza Morel speculated that this position might have developed from that community's close work with scientists on biodiversity management. By 2010, the population was estimated at about 1 million and doubling about every nine to 10 years. Although, although those estimates have since been revised, downwards, I should say, they provided ample quantitative justification for concerted efforts to reduce their number significantly. Enter the federal government's Australian Feral Camel Management Plan, which aimed to reduce the density of feral camels at nominated environmental sites. That's a quote, I should say, using aerial culling as depicted here. Between 2009 and 2013, the program removed, this is the quite clinical language, um, over 125,000 camels from the inland. But culls don't entirely solve the camel problem. In death, left where they drop, camel bodies can pollute waterholes, attract scavengers, or vacate areas that allow other camels to reinvade. And all those issues were absent from that camel management plan, as geographer Leah Gibbs has observed. There is certainly a sentiment among pastoralists and Aboriginal communities that there is an enormous amount of waste going on here, not least because there is yet to be a commercially viable way to harvest them uh, to make them conform uh, to the market. Perhaps though it is in recognising their value, their use might foster an ethics of care. 
in the case of the camel, it's their sheer numbers that seem to be their undoing, not least as they compete for scarce water resources in the drying and warming inland. It's this very excess of numbers, as Libby Robin has argued, that, diminish that diminishes the rights of individual animals. Perhaps if they were to be treated as potential food, like cattle and sheep, they might be treated differently. At the very least, we might recall Donna Haraway, who has argued that animals are not just good to think with or good to eat, but are also beings that are good to live with. Thank you.